Good morning. I'm Ben Garrett, the Maneuver Center of Excellence Public Affairs Officer, and I want to thank you for attending our media roundtable this morning. This media roundtable is for the record, and on the panel today we have Major General Eric Wesley, the Commanding General of the Maneuver Center of Excellence in Fort Benning, Brigade General Pete Jones, the Infantry Commandant, his Command Sergeant Major uh, Brady, Lieutenant Colonel Matthew Weber, the Battalion Com uh, Time Commander of the Infantry Basic Officer Leadership Course, and his Command Sergeant Major Joe Davis. We will take about the next 30 minutes for questions and answers uh, that are specifically focused on the IBOLIC, that is the Infantry Basic Officer Leadership Course training education uh, that inspires agile, adaptive, and combat-ready infantry lieutenants and their readiness to lead platoons in combat and face the challenges of tomorrow. Before we take any questions, I'll turn it over to Major Wesley uh, for some opening comments. Yeah, thanks. Appreciate that. Glad you guys are here. This is, um, this is an exciting day. It's always an exciting day when we do a graduation. The students that come through here, this particular graduation is our infantry officer basic course. Um, unique in that this is the first one where we'll have female graduates in the infantry officer basic uh, graduation ceremony. But a graduation ceremony is an indicator. It's a celebration of what we do every day, and that is to train leaders. And later today, you're going to see 166 fine lieutenants cross the stage. And I think you'll find that you're going to talk to some of them later. They're fantastic young professionals. So um, that's just a brief comment up front. I know you got a number of questions about this particular IBOLIC class, and we're prepared to take those questions. Chuck, would you like to? Yeah, uh, General Chuck Williams with Ledger Choir. Y'all start, the, the, how this class, the makeup of this class gender-wise is what? 166 soldiers. What's the gender makeup of this class? Sir, the gender makeup of this class, we have uh, 10 females that will be uh, graduating the course today, and the, and the balance, of course, are, are males. And that, and that includes uh, our, our active component as well as our National Guard, and then we have some international military students that will be graduating the course as well. Um, of the 10, how many started? How many females started the course? So we had 12 females start the course, and so 10, 10 will... Uh, have successfully met the core standards and will graduate this afternoon. Where, where do those, uh, Lieutenant Colonel, where do those soldiers, uh, male and female, where will they go when they graduate the IBOLIC class today? Where, what's the normal path for these guys now, particularly the ones that are infantry? Hey, great question, sir. So, you know, I, this is a process. Uh, the, the training uh, of an infantry lieutenant is a process until they step in front of that rifle platoon. And this is but the very first step in that process. And it's a critical one uh, because we are very much focused on training and, and preparing the soldiers, the, the lieutenants, to ultimately lead a rifle platoon. Uh, upon completion of this course this afternoon, uh, they will go into uh, a functional school. Uh, a func they will go into functional school. So uh, the first of which, uh, in, in nearly all cases, will be the Ranger course. Uh, and then they will go through, upon completion of the Ranger course, uh, whether they are successful or not, uh, they will then pr proceed into functional school training to include the Airborne School, Striker Leader course, and then Mechanized Leader course. Once they've completed all those courses, then we'll have deemed them fit to lead whatever specific type formation uh, out in ForceCom, and then they'll depart for Benning. So all of those schools are essentially a year-long process. I know it varies by the students, but is that is that accurate? It's about a year-long process to get through all those schools, including the bullet? Yes, sir, that's accurate. The other thing I'd point out, Chuck, is after they're done here at Fort Benning, they'll go out to the operational force, and every lieutenant that that happens with. In this particular case, as we are um, initiating this transition to Soldier 2020, um, what we'll do, we'll send uh, the females who graduate to two particular installations up front, to Fort Bragg and to Fort Hood, Texas. And the reason for that is we want, we want to be, enable success in this new initiative. And to enable success, one of the things we want to do is General Milley and the Chief of Staff has talked about leaders first. So we are, we are priming the pump and enabling success by initially focusing on two installations. And then ultimately they will start to migrate out to other installations. And the, this is the, I mean, right now the only captain who is in that position is Captain Grice, right? I mean, this these women will be joining 
Captain Grice headed for command, correct? Among, uh, among others. Uh, Captain Haver has also recently entered the uh, infantry branch, and General Jones can comment further on that. But even they are still in school, so they haven't migrated to the, their operational unit yet. I, I, this is for General Jones. So, ha, so has, has Captain Haver changed her MOS? She, she has been approved, and we're still waiting final word on when that's going to come down. So she has, she has uh, applied, and that is still up at DA, but we believe it's going to be approved. And then what we're going to do is assume the same process that we've worked with uh, Captain Grice. Uh, she'll be assigned a maneuver unit and go out to the field. Um, I'd like this for Command Sergeant Major Davis. In your position, as you've gone through the training of these IBOLA students, has it been any different with a gender integrated class than it was prior to prior to prior to that when it was male only? Hey, thanks, Chuck. That's a great great question, and absolutely, there, there's been no change in, in, in the in the standards. There's no, there's no change in uh, in the way the course has been run. You know, again, we're in the, the business of producing leaders, and uh, it doesn't matter. If they're male or females, I mean that gender gender integration. You know, here we've been very successful with that, and you know, I really like to kind of highlight more specifically. You know, this isn't something new. We've been we've been integrating females within uh, the military for years, and 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 so this this isn't something that, that's new. I mean, you know, I look back at you know many years uh, and past experiences overseas. We've been fighting alongside females. Uh, in infantry for many, many years, and, and I've seen them firsthand on the battlefield doing excep exceptional work. So, you know, at the end of the day, we've been very successful with the integration, and uh, really what I kind of want to highlight there is that, again, nothing's changed, you know, with the integration portion. Our standards remain the same. They've been consistent across the board, and we've been very successful in, in that aspect. Commander Sergeant Major, you don't mind me asking, how many years have you been in, and how many deployments? Well, that's a good question, too. I've been uh, about 24 years total time, time in service, and I've got about 17 different trips overseas. So I see you're with the regiment as well. Yeah, I, I, had, I had spent some time there. Yes, sir, I have. Sure. Take another question. Yes, ma'am. Good morning, Denise Mosley, WTVM. This is just uh, kind of to piggyback off of uh, your comment and just to, uh, a general question: What does this mean for the Army overall? This this new uh, integration. Uh, because, like you said, sir, this isn't something new, but um, it is uh, something new maybe for this generation, for this this new army. So, what does this mean for uh, the army overall uh, with this new integration? Let me lead off, and then I, anybody else has a comment. I'll tell you up front. I'll tell you this makes us a better army. And the reason it makes us a better army is because this whole issue has driven us. It's been a forcing function to ensure that we had the right standards aligned to each occupational specialty in the Army, to make sure we define what, is it, what are the physical standards that we expect of the various occupational uh, specialties. By defining that, what we've done is we've, we've created a gender-neutral, standards-based um, training environment. So it no longer becomes a question of, of male or female. And once you get to that minimum threshold, then we say, and oh, by the way, we've doubled the population from which we can recruit talent. So it makes us better. And to, to, to dovetail on that, this process of defining especially high physical demand standards was not just for the infantry. It was across all the different specialties. So this was a culmination of two years of different work done by uh, TRADOC with physical scientists to, you know, what is the physiology of, of moving weight? What does the, the difference between an infantryman versus a field artilleryman in terms of how do you have to ergodynamically pick up a round in a shell and put it into a tube if you're a field artilleryman or pick up the feeder and put it into use in a Bradley. So that, when you hear us say we have codified the standards, it's based on science now, not just lore, which a lot of things uh, can be historically based. But in this case, we have the scientific data that shows these are the propensity skills that you have to do and, and the physiology that is needed to do those. Denise? Thank you. OK. okay. This is for General Wesley. Uh, what did the Army learn, or General Jones, either one of y'all can answer this, what did the Army learn in the integration of Ranger School 
that carried over into the integration of Ibolic and Ebola? Well, I think that um, it starts with what I referred to a minute ago, is that um, we are a merit-based institution. And as long as you focus on what the standards are, making it everything else immaterial, you get a much better product in the end. The, and I think General Jones will tell you this, I'll let him speak for himself, but that what we found was we redoubled our efforts even across the board, we looked at all candidates going through Ranger School and ensuring that we were, we were hitting the right standards. So it caused us to focus on standards-based assessments. And I think the other, in addition to it, is all about standards. It's all about uniformity. It's Ranger, Ranger, Ranger. I mean, the, 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 I, I think, it, and this is a question obviously you'll pose to, to the, the female lieutenants, but I think if you were to ask Captain Grice, Captain Haver, and, and Captain Jaster, they want to be, you know, not female ranger, it's ranger. And same thing with lieutenant. It's lieutenant, lieutenant, lieutenant. Because they're going to be stand in front of their formation, and they're going to be judged based on their performance and their leadership skills, not on whether they're male or female. This is a question that dovetails exactly what y'all said. But looking at it now, this seems to have been done in a lower media profile than the Ranger integration. Was that by design or is that, I mean? No, I think what you're seeing here is an indicator that this is business as usual. Um, we do missions in the Army and we get tasks all the time. And we're very good at doing that which we're asked to do. We figure out how to do it and we knock it out. And so what you're seeing here is, you know, the Ranger um, scenario was new um, and there was a lot of scrutiny. I think that when General Miller was here and the leadership that was here validated the scrutiny by virtue of the fact that they accomplished what they were directed to do and they got three great Rangers out of it. So now we're going into phase two and we're looking at officers integrated into IBOLIC and this is a mission that we do every day. And that's why I let off by saying that what we're celebrating here today is the fact that we have graduated 166 new young professionals. And, and I think what you're seeing is our emphasis is on training leaders. I mean, we get the, the potential from, in this case, West Point, ROTC, OCS. Once they come here, I, make, I, I indoctrinate them and give them their welcome speech. And after I ask them to raise their hand of what their commission source is, I say, I'll never ask again, because they're lieutenants. They're starting this waypoint on a journey to be a leader and an infantry officer. That's how we see it. We're training leaders every day, and that's our job and our mission here at Fort Benning. Sir, if I, if I could add, I, I would just say that here in the institution is the foundation for everything that we're going to do in the military. So, so we're giving them the necessary tools. We're exposing them to the doctor and the POIs, you know, from, a, from an institutional standpoint, those, those functional areas that's going to give them yet more skill sets uh, when they get to the, the uh, operational force or force comm units. Uh, so once they get to that force comm unit, they're going to be paired up with that non-commissioned officer that's uh, been deployed or not deployed, but understands how platoons, companies, and those sort of things uh, need to perform uh, in today's environment. Uh, so they're, they're going to, you know, quickly uh, establish that relationship that's going to make them very, very successful. You're going to have that company commander, those field grade officers, that's going to allow them to be exposed to how those units, how they train uh, and, and operate to, to see what... Uh, right looks like, if you will, uh, because it's different here because, again, it's, it's an institute as opposed to what we're doing in Force Comm and how we go out to support the combatant commanders and that sort of stuff. This is for the table as a whole. Before we get to that one, hold that one, sorry, Denise, have another one? Uh, sirs, I don't really know how you can answer this question, but maybe you can speak to the question. Um, just wondering what you all may see as far as the um, from both sides um, of the table, as far as gender is concerned, the, the mentality of the male soldier and the female soldier, ha how has the their mentality progressed as far as, because I remember back during uh, the Ranger process, um, hearing uh, some of the male officers say, kind of say, well, I didn't think that she could, but she, I didn't see her as a woman when she was there picking my stuff up and helping me 
through the course. How has that progression, if you all have seen it, come? How, how has it grown? I'm gonna, I'll lead off, then I'll let some of the others comment. Um, the first thing is you're going to meet six young, great lieutenants here in a little bit, three female, three male, and you should ask them that question because um, I think you're going to have a drop mic moment when you meet these um, young lieutenants. Um, but I, I would tell you just in my engagements with them, what they I think you, you may find a, a scenario where in the first uh, moments that question might be there in their mind, but because we're a merit-based institution, very quickly it all becomes uh, a, prof a professional environment. And all of that goes away. It just falls away because the focus is on standards, the focus is on professionalism, and that becomes transparent to the whole dynamic. Um, any observations, Pete? Or and I think, you know, it also comes the fact that you look at somebody in terms of their merit and what they accomplish and being part of a team. And uh, when you see that it doesn't matter that the sex, it doesn't matter the nationality, it matters, hey, we're a team and we're here to accomplish a mission. And I, you know, I come from a unique background is I have a sister who's in the Army, she runs farther, I can run a little bit faster, all right? She's smarter. Okay, she's MI, I'm infantry, and uh, she's a general and I'm a general. So it's based on performance, and that's the one good thing that the Army does. Okay, Chuck. During the integration of Ranger School, one of the NCOs said that he felt like he was watching a Jackie Robinson moment. From your perspective, and this is for all five of y'all, if any of y'all want to answer it, have you felt like you're watching something? You're in the middle of something that's historical right now. Sir, so we acknowledge we're in the, in the midst of something historical. However, you know, as Sergeant Major alluded to, you know, integration is not something new. It's not something new to our Army. Uh, I'd like to highlight the, the extreme professionalism with respect to our implementation. Uh, the cadre, myself included, we address the fact that obviously this is the first gender integrated class at day one of the course. And then from that point forward, it was not an issue. Uh, the cadre, the NCO and officer cadre, all infantry uh, performed to an extremely high standard. They applied the course standards, uh, trained the lieutenants, evaluated them objectively. Uh, and at the end of the day, um, we have graduates that are, that are trained and ready to lead rifle platoons. But at the end of the day, there are some military historians on this panel that obviously know this is something that's going to be written yeah. about down the line. I, I think this is a, a very special time, and, and there's a couple of reasons for that. Well, I had the opportunity to um, present Captain Grice for Blue Corps to becoming an infantryman. And that was a special moment because what we saw is another um, step in this institution continuing to reflect American values, and that is opportunity to compete. And so we saw that, and any time you do a first, that's a special moment. But I, but I agree with Colonel Weber that very quickly these things start to um, fall away by virtue of the fact that we, we are a profession that um, is merit-based, standards-based, and, and carries out tasks. And so it's, it's as if we've been there before. So I, we always say, you know, the, those, those football players on the gridiron, you know, don't celebrate too much. Act like you've been there before. And, and we know how to do this. And we have in, been integrating women into the military for years. They've fought and bled alongside us for years. Um, this is an important moment, but this is something that is very, in many ways business as usual. And I will tell you, every time you have a class, you have a Jackie Robinson moment. Okay, because Jackie Robinson got where he was because of his talents and his skill and his desire to excel. So my question as I look at every infantry class is which one's going to be the next Colonel Puckett? Which one's going to be the next General McChrystal? And which one of these females is going to look at General Dunwoody and say, I can do that because it's already been done in another branch and I'm going to excel as a leader in this chosen profession? Ma'am? Uh, has there been uh, anything added to readiness for the families uh, of the soldiers uh, to prepare them for what they're being prepared for and trained for? In other words, is, is there any type of uh, new form of counseling that may be set up for 
Um, family members, just a question that um, lay people may want to know. So I'll just say that we, again, we're all professionals, we're all soldiers. In this case, there are 166 infantrymen. Um, we, we have um, resources like that for soldiers and their families, but not distinct for those who happen to be female or male. So all soldiers and their families, that, this is a big team. And so we embrace that team and communicate with the team, just as you are, you're implying, but not anything new. Any last questions, Chuck? Thank you all for your time, Anything? sir. Anything? Thank you. Panel? Sir, would you like to make a final statement? Yeah, I, I, I think so. I, I really would encourage you all to look at this as uh, a great moment that um, reflects the institution of the military and our core competency, which is training leaders. And so um, it's just amazing to see the lieutenants that come through here, and all soldiers, but in this case, because we've got Ibolic, these are people that have raised their hand and they want to serve, in this case, in the infantry. And, and what we do best here is, is to train young leaders, and you're going to see 166 of them all who have met the standards of the infantry, supervised by a lot of great cadre um, for the last several months. And um, so this is just another turn of a great generation of young kids that are willing to serve their nation. And so we're, we appreciate that happening, and we just uh, we're thank you for, for being here. Sir, uh, gentlemen, thank you very much for participating today and your time. Uh, we greatly appreciate it, and, and I think we're off the record at this time. We'll take a short break and prepare for our next media panel.